Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you're all well and doing good. Live Monday night. Good evening, Andrea. So, as you know, good evening, Yochanan. Um, 1 a.m. in the UK. Wow, I'm glad you're watching us. Thanks for the background. Thanks for the compliments. So the background's about the city of Stone being destroyed. I want to share with you, I know that many of you know that this past Shabbos, I was home. I was not in the shul as I normally would be, reading the Torah, giving the sermon, talking, you know, being with my, my community. I was home in quarantine with my family. We had a beautiful Shabbos, Baruch Hashem, davening together, enjoying each other's company. And I also had the time to learn that I don't usually have. And I had the time to read through a fascinating book called uh, The Kabbalistic History of Civilization by a not such a well-known book. I read it from cover to cover. Fascinating, fascinating presentation. It would take many hours to give over what I learned over the course of that weekend, last past weekend. So I want to try and take a snippet, one gem, one story of what I studied over Shabbos that's in this week's Torah reading and show you the deeper meaning that exists within Torah. But by way of introduction, I want to make a very long introduction. That's very important. The reason why the introduction is important, good evening, everyone that's watching. Uh, and thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed the live video, Andrew, before Shabbos. Erev Tov Jacob. The reason why this introduction is important is, first of all, because the introduction I'm going to give is going to explain a whole new perspective on how a Jew is meant to learn Torah. How we, as believers in the truth and in the divinity of Torah, are meant to open up the Torah and to study the Torahs, the stories of the Torah, especially in the book of Genesis, in the first book of the Torah. The second reason why this introduction, introduction is important is because this is the introduction that I am not going to be presenting at the JLI series that will be starting on uh, Wednesday, God willing, online. If you want to join us for Secrets of the Bible starting this Wednesday, Ezrat Hashem online, uh, you, you should. It's going to be a fascinating, fascinating course, a six-week course of the famous stories, the most famous stories, the Garden of Eden, Adam, Jacob, and Esau, Noah's flood, um, the story of Yosef being sold by his brother, the story of Korah, famous stories that sadly most Americans, most educated intellectual adults have a Hebrew school understanding of these stories. So there's really an introduction to that first class that I'm not going to be making. I'm going to give today instead, which is a Kabbalistic understanding of how we are meant to be studying the stories of the Torah. So I want to begin by reading some Kabbalah together inside. Erev Tov, Randy. I want to begin by studying some Kabbalah, some Zohar. And when we're going to read this Zohar together, you're going to understand how Hasidus, how, a, how we are meant to study Torah. And then with that introduction, what I will share with you tonight about the city of stone, I hope it will blow you away as much as it blew me away. I'm going to share with you stuff that I read this Shabbos. It was like, wow, I never knew this before. But when you understand that this is the way a Jew is meant to study, you'll appreciate the, the, the beauty. So I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to, we're going to read a translation in English from Chabad.org on, um, on, um, on uh, some Zohar. It's actually from Baloscha, but it's very, very powerful. And then we're going to discuss a specific story this week's story. Okay, so hopefully you see on the screen a quote from the Zohar, Rabbi Shimon says. Rabbi Shimon says, we won't read all of it all, just read part of it. Rabbi Shimon says, I should say it's nice classes in the schos of um, Yonatan and Yitzchak Tzvi and Tzipor about Hosea. Rabbi Shimon says, woe to the man who says that the Torah can simply relate to stories came simply to relate stories and tales of mundane matters. If it was so, even at the present day, we could produce a Torah from simplistic matters and perhaps even nicer than those. However, if it came to illustrate worldly matters, then, you know, even the rulers of the world have stories that are superior to what's written in the Torah. If so, let's make our own Torah. 
Rather, as it says in the next paragraph, come and see the world above and the world below are measured with one scale. One scale. Whatever happens in the world below is a direct reflection of what is happening in the world above. There's no, there's no distinction. There's no separations. There's no separation. I mean, I, we're not going to do the whole thing inside, but the point is that the Torah is, I'll just read the end of the paragraph, that once the Torah, the Torah is very lofty, but once it was brought down to this world, if the Torah had not donned all these coverings and the garments of this world, the world would not have been able to tolerate the wisdom, the brilliance of the Torah. Therefore, says the next paragraph, this story of the Torah is the mantle of the Torah. It's the covering of the Torah. He who thinks that this mantle is the actual essence of the Torah and that is nothing else is in there, let his spirit deflate. Listen to those words. Let his spirit deflate and let him have no part in the world to come. Therefore, pretty cool. Um, therefore, let, the, the verse says, open my eyes that I may behold the wondrous things out of your Torah, what lies under that garment of the Torah. So basically, the, we're going to explain in the Zohar, let me make this bigger. So we're going to explain in the Zohar that there's three dimensions to Torah. There's three dimensions to Torah. There is Torah, the mantle of Torah. You know, when you take the Torah out of the ark, there's the covering on the Torah. There is the actual scroll, the words of the Torah. And then there is the soul, the essence of the Torah, the soul of the Torah. And what we're going to discover is that the stories of the Torah, there's the laws of the Torah, and then there is the soul, the secret, the true life and inner dimension of the Torah. Let's read this inside. Come and see. One second. Come and see. There is a garment that is visible to everyone. The simple people, when they see a person dressed beautifully, do not observe any further and they consider the garment as the body of the man and the body like his soul. So if you're an ignoramus, if you're a very simple, foolish person, you see someone and you wear nice clothing and you judge them by their clothing instead of seeing that there's a body inside the clothing. And without seeing it, there's a soul inside the body. Similar to this, here similar to this is the Torah. The Torah has the garment, the mantle, which is the stories of the Torah. It has a body which is composed of the commandments of the Torah called the body of the Torah. The body is clothed with the garments, which are the stories of the world. So the ignorant of the world only look at the dress, which is the story of the Torah, and they're not aware of anything more. They do not look at what lies beneath that dress. Those who do know more don't look at the dress, but rather at the body beneath that dress. And then you have the wise, the sages, the servants of the loftiest kings, those that stood at Mount Sinai. They look only at the soul, which is the essence of everything, the real Torah. In the world to come, that doesn't look at the soul of the Torah. And I'm going to share with you, well, let's read the next paragraph of the Zohar. It is truly sharp, sharp word that are going to be in the next paragraph. Woe to those wicked who say that the Torah is merely a story and nothing more, for they look at the dress and no further. Praise are the righteous who look properly at the Torah. Why, and last, only if it in a jug. Similarly, the Torah does not endure except in this mantle. Therefore, there's no need to look except at what is beneath the mantle. That is why all these matters and all these stories are garments. That, my friends, is absolutely amazing. Okay. Now, let me go back. Let me stop sharing. So, oopsies. That is what it says in the Zohar. So, basically, the Zohar is saying, there we go. So, basically, the Zohar is saying that there is a soul of the Torah, just like a human being. A human being has clothing, they have a body, and they have a soul. The clothing of a person is the most external part of the person. There's a person inside a body. But really, a person is not the body. Really, a person is the soul. So too, you can study the stories of the Torah and get distracted by the fact that they're stories. 
and not realize that the story is actually only a garment in which the body, in which the primary teachings and laws and messages and the values of the Torahs of the Torah can survive. The Torah, in a spiritual form, without the physical words and ideas that we know, can survive. So that is the first uh, part of the Torah that we need to know. But there's a soul of the Torah. The soul of the Torah is the essence of the Torah. The essence of the Torah is its true inner meaning. And that's what the Zohar is saying, that truly wise, the sons of God that, that study the Torah, who are at Mount Sinai, they don't get distracted by only a body. They look at a story and they look, what is the deeper meaning? What is a spiritual story that's happening over here? What is the, the, as we said before from the Zohar, the world is a reflection, it's a scale, everything is exactly opposite. So when we're seeing a story that happened here below, what's the real story? What's the story behind the story? And for that, you need Kabbalah and you need Chassidus to understand. I'm giving now a shameless plug for the series that we're starting this week on Secrets of the Bible. This, I, this, what I said now is not going to be repeated on Wednesday, maybe like in one minute and two minutes. We're not going to be reading the Zohar inside, although I'm going to briefly mention this point. They're going to take the story of Adam and even the Garden of Eden, which, by the way, this book I was studying today, the whole story of the Garden of Eden, fascinating way of understanding the story. Fascinating of how was the beginning of a journey of tikkun, which I'm going to explain in a minute. This is what, it, what I learned on Shabbos. But on Wednesday, we'll take a different exposure based on Kabbalah, based on Hasidus, specifically focusing on the tree of knowledge. What was the sin of eating the tree? Why did Adam and Eve get rewarded? by they got, The sin was knowledge, and they got knowledge, so they got rewarded. Nine questions on the story we're going to address, God willing. Same thing with the story of the flood, and the story with Jacob stealing the blessings from his brother, et cetera, et cetera. Beautiful stories, beautiful. Uh, having read through most of the course over the weekend, having prepared the first class well, I can tell you that you should you should join us. If money's an issue, just send me an email. I'd be glad to give out scholarships. We've given out some scholarships, some more scholarships. So to Wednesday night, we'll talk about the story of the Garden of Eden in great depth, great depth. And that will be only for those who are registered. It's not going to be on Facebook, unfortunately. Tonight, I want to talk about the story of Sidom. Why? Primarily because the story of Sidom is in this week's Torah reading. So since it's in this week's Parsha, let's talk about the story of Sidom. But I want to give you the big picture. Before I get into the story of Sidom, I need to give you a big picture. The big picture is that when God created the universe, God had a utopian vision, a dream, of a perfect universe, which would be the universe when Mashiach comes. As I'm sure many of you know, we had the opportunity and the ability, we, when I say we, I mean humankind, as represented by Adam and Eve, had the opportunity through Adam and Eve to perfect the world at the time when Adam and Eve were living in the Garden of Eden, and we could have ushered in an era of Mashiach forever at that time. Sadly, it didn't happen because of the story of Adam and Eve eating from the tree of knowledge, which is a fascinating story that we need to understand. What was the tree? Why did they eat from the tree? What was the consequences of that? Which I will discuss, God willing, on Wednesday night. Please email me if you want to join the course. What happens after that is that the world is plunged down. And now for the rest of the story of humanity, we are working on finding a tikkun, a rectification, a way of fixing the blemish that happened through Adam and Eve eating from the tree. And we are trying, still till today, we the descendants of Adam and Eve, are trying to find a way to bring the world back to its per, even better, not just back to, to an even higher place than it was in the Garden of Eden, which is also not the point of tonight's class. That's just a big picture. Started by Adam and Eve, and we're working on, we got plunged down into this world, and we're working on finding a tikkun, a rectification, to be able to bring in an era of Mashiach, a world perfection once again. As the story continues, there's many opportunities of tikkun. You have to, I'll give you a beautiful example. When you have a little tree, you plant a tree. First you have the seed. Adam and Eve the seed in the Garden of Eden. You scratch the tree, it doesn't work. You plant it. If it starts to grow a little crooked, you can always fix it. The more the tree grows, the harder it is to fix the blemish, to fix the crookedness of the tree. 
And so there were many opportunities in the beginning of the story of humanity where we had the opportunity to perfect the world, to usher in this era of Mashiach, and sadly we didn't. And with each failed opportunity, the tikkun that we humanity need to do only gets bigger. So when Noah, I'm going to give you one example, which will be the second class of the six-week course that we'll be teaching, God willing, next week's class. When Noah is experiencing the flood, Noah has an opportunity given to him by God to start a new world and to make a tikkun of what happened before and to start from a very, very high place in fixing the world and bringing the world into an era of Mashiach. The opportunity was there. When Noah exited the ark, and there's actually many similarities to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, but when Noah exits the ark, he has an opportunity to start fresh. And what happens? It says, Vayichal, he planted a vineyard, but the word Vayichal can be the word Chol. He became mundane. Mundane means he lost the opportunity to create a holiness in the universe. He got drunk. And when they got drunk, Ham, the father of Canaan, violates his father. The Torah doesn't say explicitly what it is that he does, but the Torah says he reveals the erva of his father. An erva means an abomination, a disgusting thing. He reveals the nakedness of his father. And by revealing the nakedness of his father, Ham, and primarily the son Canaan, who is one of the sons of Ham, become the source of all immorality and corruption and uh, uh, the, the uh, evil and depraved behavior in the world. Ham has several sons, including Mitzrayim and the Ammon, and many of the nations that live in the land of Israel, all are descendants of Ham, who is cursed. And now the tikkun that we humanity need to do is not just a tikkun of Adam and Eve, now it's also a tikkun of Noah. It has to be done through a different son of Noah, which is shame. And uh, there's a beautiful, if you read through the stories of the Torah with this mindset, the entire book of Beratius, the entire book of Beratius, that I was studying over the weekend, it all fits. Shame is a son that has to do with the tikkun of Noah, sin of drunkenness, and that's why the family of Avraham comes from shame, and the family of uh, Nimrod, and then the others are from Ham. We, we can't get into all of the details now, but let's we get this big picture. We get this flow going. And now we come to Avraham. And again, I'm skipping. You go through the ten generations, each one of the ten generations. The Torah tells us their names. And in their names, we see different dimensions of what they were and how they descended and became further depraved and further, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'm not sure the Chinese are not from Ham and Canaan. The, the land of Canaan is not Chinese. There was a comment about Ham and Canaan being Chinese. Canaan is the land of Israel. Specifically, the holiest land in the universe, which is Israel, is specifically referred to countless times in the Torah as the land of Canaan, because the ultimate transformation and tikkun is when the Jews, coming from Avram, who comes from shame, will refine and elevate and transform the depravity and the corruption of the land of Canaan, the land that was from the descendants of Ham, specifically the most de- corrupted and most depraved of all the sons of, of, Canaan, of Ham, which is Canaan, to transform the land of Canaan into the land of Israel. Um, so that's uh, this whole this is a very deliberate, very, very deliberate story of how Avram is going to the land of Israel, God sends him there, etc. I want to talk about within the land of Israel, there was one part of the land of Israel that was the most beautiful, most lush, most beautiful part of the land of Israel. And because it was physically so rich, so l- full of produce and such a fertile land is a proof of its spiritual sparks of holiness and energy that existed over there. By the way, just one more thing, Jacob, regarding with Shrim, I don't remember all the names I've had. If you look at the Torah, I actually studied this weekend. All the, 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 the whole Middle East, and you look at many of these countries, they're all, they were all corrupt. They all come from Ham. Anyway, I, I don't want to go too off subject. The point is that um, my glass over here. The point is that the um, the land of Israel is a beautiful land, but back in biblical times, 
the richest part of the land, the most luscious, the most fertile part of the entire land of Israel, was the southern area of Israel called the area, the region of stone. Five cities, as the Torah tells us, and when Lot was choosing where to move, so Lot had to make a choice. I have in front of me the entire Torah, and the, the, the Chabad Torah, but I don't know if I'll read it inside or not. But when Avram, when Lot had to make a choice, there was basically, the um, last week's Torah reading, we learned that there was a uh, the, the, the shepherds of Lot, and the shepherds, let me go back a second. Who is Lot? Let's go back one second, make sure everyone's following me. This is very important to know, by the way. This is very, very important. So, Avram has a father called Terach. Terach has three sons, okay? Probably should have had a screen on the uh, chart on the screen, but it's okay. Terach has three sons. One is um, Avraham. You all know who Avraham is. One is Haran. And one is Nachar, okay? Let's leave Nachar on the side. Nachar is the father of Besuel, who is the father of Rivka and Lavan. You all know who Rivka is. She's the wife of Isaac. You all know who Lavan is. He is the father-in-law of Jacob, the father of Rachel Leah. And according to Amedrish, Bill and Zilpah, the maids of Rachel and Leah, are actually his children from one of his, his maids. Um, so the, he's the grandfather of the 12 tribes are born from Yaakov and from Rachel Leah, Bill and Zilpah, who are the grandchildren of Lavan, who is the son of Besuel, who is the son of of Nachar. That's one son of Terach. Okay? Avram is the other son. The third son is Haran. Mm-hmm. Haran was very much a believer in what Avram was saying. At the same time that he believed in Avram and the idea of one God and monotheism and belief in Hashem and that idols are wrong, at the same time, he couldn't bring himself to renounce his idol worship. You know people that are on both sides of the fence? They're here. They're with you. And then they're with them, they're, they're both sides. That was Haran. And we're told that when Nimrod told Avram, bow down to the idols, I'm going to throw you into the fiery furnace, I'm going to kill you, and Avram absolutely refused to budge, Haran silently was saying, let me see what happens. If Avram survives the fire, because he believed that Avram could survive. He believed in miracles. He believed in God. If God saves Avram and he survives, then I am putting my lot in with Avram, and I'm saying I also believe in God. And if Avram doesn't make it out of the fire alive, then I don't believe in this God anymore, and I'm going to stay with him. Avram, as you all know, comes out of the fire alive, and because he comes out alive, so then Haran says, I too believe in the God of Avram. I too renounce idol worship. But he only said it because he had seen the miracles of Avram. He didn't truly, truly feel it with the ultimate conviction of his heart. And therefore, when he went into the fire, he was... Nimrod threw him into the fire too, and he was um, he was killed and burned by the fire. Haran had a son. His son was called Lot, the nephew of Avraham. So when Terach is forced to leave the land of Nimrod, which is a place called ur which is today Iraq, Mesopotamia, and they travel towards a place called Haran, not to be confused with Haran. So Terach brings his son Avram and his nep- and Avram's nephew Lot, his grandson, comes together with. And when Avram goes to Israel, and the God says to Avram, Lech Lecha, travel away, Lot travels together with his uncle. He says, I believe in the God of Avram. And they travel together to Israel. And it helps Lot tremendously. He becomes very, very wealthy. When they go down to Egypt, he becomes wealthy. He becomes a rich man in his own, in his own right. So now that Lot and Avram are both wealthy, the shepherds of Lot begin to fight with the shepherds of Avraham. And they argue that since Avraham has no biological children, eventually one day Lot will be the inheritor, the heir of Avraham's wealth, which includes the entire land of Canaan. And therefore, already now, we can let our sheep and our cattle graze anywhere we want in the land, even though they're eating on other people's property. And Avraham's shepherds refused to do that. They were trained not to let anyone steal. And became a fight between the shepherds. So Avram says to Lot, let's not fight. This is last week's story reading. Let's not fight. Let's be friends. You choose which way you want to go. If you want to go to the right, I'll go to the left. If you want to go to the left, I'll go to the right. You choose. 
Lo raised his eyes, looks around, and it says that he saw that the south of Kikar, the valley of stone. I'm quoting the words was Kigan Hashem, Eretz Stone. That's what it says. Kigan Hashem, Eretz Stone, like the garden of God was the land of stone. Meaning from a Kabbalistic spiritual perspective here. Well, one second, I jumped ahead. Literally, what does that mean? That the land of stone, which today is where the Dead Sea is. Today you go to the Dead Sea, to the south, it's nothing. There's nothing there. Masada, it's beautiful. Masada is beautiful, but there's there's nothing growing there. I shouldn't say that. The Israelis are brilliant, and they've developed uh, orchards and all that growing. You have olive orchards growing in the south, in the desert. You see with their drip irrigation, but naturally it's it's nothing. Nothing's growing. But then it was Kigan Hashem. It was like the Garden of God. It was the richest, most fertile land in all of Israel, in all of the Middle East. But on a spiritual perspective, what does it mean? That it's Kigan Hashem? That there's a spiritual power here. There's spiritual, tremendous, tremendous spiritual part, powers of holiness that are embedded within stone. And I want to go there. And what Lord is really saying on a spiritual, cosmic level is that I am going to go and refine the sparks, the holiness that is embedded within Sodom, this tremendously wealthy place, and I'm going to transform it. So the spiritual story of Lot going to Sodom is a tikkun, a tikkun, a rectification of the moral immorality that is in Sodom, the wealth of Sodom, to uplift it, to elevate it, etc. However, however, the exact opposite happens. Lot goes to Sodom, and instead of being Avram's agent of purification and of transformation, Instead, he becomes sucked into stone and he becomes influenced by those who he had come to influence. Tragic story. Tragic. Avram is telling Lot, you choose where in Israel you... I, look, basically, what's on a spiritual level, Avram realizes that the power of me and Lot together is too much for one area. The land can't handle both of us in the same space. So he says to Lot, you choose. You want to refine the right area? I'll go to the, to the east. I'll go to the west. Whichever you choose. And Lot takes stone, but he fails. And this brings us to a fascinating story. There's a story that's in last week's parsha. I'm not going to get to this week's parsha soon too. But it's all the same story of stone. There's so many other things that I'm not talking about. I'm only focusing on the stone part. I want to tell you a story. It's the last six parts. I'm not going to read it inside because it's long. And I want to just get to the main point. And I want to ask you a question that I never, I'm telling you honestly, I never thought about this till this weekend. We're told the whole story how Lod was living in stone. And there was a whole war between four kings and five kings. The five kings, including the king of stone, were paying taxes to uh, different, to uh, uh, Shina, uh, not Shina, to, um, Slip my mind now, and eventually, up to 13 are paying taxes. There's a civil war, a rebellion, a revolution. And this king, Shinar, no, 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 Shinar, so he gets a rally together, other kings that are with him, four kings in total. One of those kings is Amraphel. Amraphel is the king of Shinar, that's what it says in the Torah. And they wage a war against the five kings, they wage a war. And eventually the four, it's a whole long story. And when I was sharing this with my kids, by the way, in the in, in, on Shabbos, our Shabbos table, I tried sharing this idea. My daughter says, yeah, we learned it in the Chumash. It's so boring. It's so long and boring. And it is. It's long and technical. This, I go through all the names, each king, which kingdom they had. Names that mean nothing to us. If you're looking at the clothing, even if you're looking at the body, but if you're looking at the soul, every name of every king represents a different spiritual force that was fighting over here. And these four kings, these four forces, are fighting against five forces. And what happens if four kings win? Four kings win. And I'm going to tell you, let me tell you the story first, we'll go deeper. And then the refugee, the refugee, who is actually Og, comes to Avram. He says, your nephew was captured, he was kidnapped by the kings. And uh, Avram goes to wage war against these four kings. Avram goes to fight a war together with Eliezer and 318 men, or as my son Mayor Shalom said on Facebook, Zalman said on Facebook last week, really there was no other man, it was just Eliezer alone, 
who the numerical value of the mother gets is 318, 318. They go to fight war. They start the war in Sidon, in the south of Israel. If you know where Sidon is, it's where the Dead Sea is. The Dead Sea is all the way in the south of Israel. They says in the Torah they chased the enemy all the way until Damascus. Damascus is Damascus in Syria. That's north of Israel. In fact, it says in the commentaries that the Golan Heights, all of the Golan, which today Baruch Hashem was recognized to be part of Israel, the Golan was acquired by Avram going to fight the wars, chasing the enemies all the way past there. So Avram, with the help of Eliezer, had literally chased an enemy from the south of Israel through the entire land of the land of Israel, all the way up till, till the land, till Syria, till Damascus, which is crazy. And then what happens after that? The Torah says, I should actually have just so you can read it, but it's but it's okay. The Torah says, what happens after that? The king of stone was hiding in one of the lime pits. He fell into a lime pit. He was hiding there. He fell in. He climbs out miraculously, climbs out of the lime pit, and he publicly concedes that the king of the God of Avram is the righteous God, because no other explanation for such a miraculous victory. There was such a powerful army, these four armies. And he says to Avram, everything is yours. Excuse me. All the wealth is yours. Take all the wealth and do with it as you wish. I only ask for the people. I'm giving you all the rechush. Only ten li hanefesh. These are the words. Ten li hanefesh. Give me the souls. V'harechush kachlach and the wealth take for yourself. And what does Avram answer? I don't want any money. I don't want a penny. You can keep all of the wealth and you can keep all the people. You can keep all the people. <laughs> Avram, including who? Including Light. So what happens to Light after the war is over? He goes back to Stein. So I'm going to ask you the most simple of simple questions. Why does the Torah dedicate a full entire chapter of the Torah? I don't know, 40, 50 verses, long verses with names and details and kingdoms that they represented, named all non-Jewish kings, all kings of non-Jewish lands fighting a war over money and taxes, nothing to do with the Jewish people. Also, Avram can save light. And what happens after? Light goes back to Stein. So what changed? What changed? It's a war. Thousands of people brought down the war. A war from the south of Israel all the way up to Damascus. For what? So Avram should let light go back to Stone? And what does Avram gain out of it? Nothing. Why does the Torah need to tell us the story? So what's the message? What's the point? Mm-hmm. We go further. You would think Avram wants to take the souls. The king of Soma is saying, I want the souls. You take the men. You take the wealth. You can take the animals, the cattle, the gold, the silver. It's all yours. You earned it. But I was asking for the people back. Why does Avram even want the people? I want to tell you something, my friends. One of the kings is Amraphel. Amraphel says Rashi is because why was it called Amraphel? Amraphel is the king of Nimrod. Remember Nimrod? Nimrod is the one that threw Avram into the fiery furnace for not worshiping idols. He's called Amraphel as a hint because Omar Pearl. He said, Omar, he said, Phil, fall into the fire. And the other kings, he's the king of Shina, the king of the valley. Shina is where the Tower of Babylon happened. The Tower of Babylon was led by Nimrod. Avram is refighting the war when Nimrod kicked him out. And Nimrod sent him flying and chased him away because he wouldn't bow down to the idols and he won in the fire. So Nimrod kicks him away. This whole war is not a war about stone. It's a war where Avram is now conquering Nimrod. It's a war where Avram is fulfilling the promise of God. God tells Avram, the land that you see, Walk the land, and whatever you walk, you will acquire. The act of walking the land was an act of acquisition. By Avram conquering all of the land of Israel, from the south of Israel all the way up to the very north of Israel, made this transformation. He conquered the entire land of Israel. Conquered, it's all his. It's all his. He well, conquered it. We already find Avram conquering the land. Now that alone itself is amazing. It's amazing. So then why does Avram not keep it? Avram conquered the whole land, the land that God said to him, I'm going to give to you one day. He conquered it from, hello, why is he not keeping it? 
Avram understood that when the king of Sodom says, Tanli had nefesh, give me the souls, it means that the spiritual tikkun of the of the wealth of Sodom has not yet happened. Hasn't happened. Avram has just now made a tremendous tikkun and all these other kings. But Sodom still remains Sodom. And Lot still hasn't fulfilled his purpose in making his rectification of that. So Avram says, okay, Lot can go back to stone. This, everything go back to stone. Take the money back to stone. Because I don't need the money. It's not my tikkun. It's the, you can only fix what God wants you to fix. Avram understood that the, fix, the rectification of stone was not his business. It was Lot's business. Lot has to be there. And so he's willing to do whatever he can to enable Lot to be there to do what Lot needs to do. Let's fast forward to this week's story. I hope you are following along with me. Fast forward, the story continues. Angel, I hope, just to make sure, I want to just make sure I'm clear for one second before I fast forward. If you understand what I'm saying, it's just the entire war, the entire the taxes and the 13 years of battle and the 14 years of, uh, 13 years of paying taxes and the 14 years of the battle and the, the whole capture of light and the battle by Avram going all the way up through uh, and then Malki Tzedek, the king of Shalim, Shalim is Yerushalayim, coming and Avram giving him wealth and making a peace treaty. This is all happening. This whole story is happening for one purpose and one purpose only, that Avram can begin to make part of the tikkun that has to happen, the rectification that has to happen in the land of Israel. It's amazing. So Avram does his part. Avram is successful in his part. But Lod has to do his part. Does the Lord do his part? No. They remain wicked and evil. Come this week's Torah reading, and Avram is visited by three angels after his circumcision. Three angels come to Avram, and now you're under the story. Avram says, come, my masters, come eat under the tree. They come, and while they're eating, the Torah tells us that what are they eating? Matzah. It was Erev Pesach. And when they came, Avram was busy making matzah. Avram says to them, Come, sit down, he feeds them, they eat the matzah, and then one angel comes to heal Avram. One angel comes to share the good news that they will have a child. One year later, on that night, they will have a child. And the third angel, angel comes to go and destroy the city of Sidon. So Avram hears the story, whatever, very good. They're going to have a child, they make a mark on the wall. They get up in the morning to go, and they start to travel to Sidon. And while they traveled into Sodom, Hashem says, am I going to hide from Avram what I'm going to do? Avram is part of the, the, this is his land. The land of Israel is Avram's land. He's in charge of rectifying it, fixing it, uplifting it, elevating it. So he says to himself, God says to himself, I must tell Avram what I'm going to do. And God comes to Avram, he says to Avram, I'm going to destroy the city of Sodom. And Avram begins to dive into Hashem and says, if there's 58 righteous people, if there's 40 righteous people, if there's 30 righteous people, 20. Eventually, Avram tries and tries and tries. And after Avram says, if there's only 10 righteous people, I beg you, O oh God, to save the city. And God says, there is not even 10 righteous people. Avram, it says, Avram, Shavlim Kaime, Avram returns to his place. And then the angels arrive in stone. This is it. Two angels arrive. One angel is coming to destroy the city. And one angel is coming, the same angel, the Malach Rafal, that had come to heal Avram, is given a new job to be the one to save Lot and his family from the destruction of Sodom. This part is very important. They come to the city, and it says that Lot is sitting by the gates of the city. A contrast, by the way, Avram, when he saw the angels, where was he? Just a side point up, a very interesting. Where was Avram sitting when the angels came? By the tent by the doors of his tent, looking for visitors. And when the angels come to stone, where is Lot sitting? By the gates of the city, but not because he was looking for visitors, but because they had just appointed him as a judge of the city. A judge is din, is gvura, is righteous severity. Avram was chesed, and Lot was gvura. So Avram is sitting by the doors of an open tent, kindness, and Lot is sitting by the courthouse. Gates of the city was the ancient day courthouse, giving out judgment. Interesting comparison, contrast. Comes and what day is it? It's Pesach. Remember this. It's Pesach. Why is it important for Rashi to tell us 
that the day that they come is Pesach. Normally, Rashi only tells us the simple interpretation of the verse. Rashi's job is not to give you esoteric, Kabbalistic ideas. Rashi's job is to tell you that it's how to understand the story. And yet Rashi feels it's very important for you to know that this story happens on Passover. So hold that thought. We're going to get back to it. Lot sees the angels. He says, please come to my home. First, they refuse to come. Eventually, they come. He brings them into his home. And what happens? So the people of Stone find out that there's visitors that are over there. You know what? They're going to share my screen for a second. We're going to read just a little bit inside because there's some very interesting comparisons that I think uh, would be interesting to see why it's not even open to share. Um, Something happened there. Okay, I won't share it. Um, I don't know how to do it. Never mind. So anyway, they uh, they come. I'll just I'll tell, I'll tell you the story outside. I don't see the share button. So anyway, so they uh, they come to his home, and the the the, the wife of of Lot was not very happy that they had invited visitors to the home. She know that in Stone they were very very anti visitors, very anti visitors. I don't have time to go into the whole story of Stone. It's a fascinating story. I want to give a whole class on the, the nature, the, 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 the maybe I'll share a link, the personality of Stone, on the, on the wickedness of Stone. It's not for tonight. But the point is they didn't like guests. And um, so Lot go, Lot's wife goes around. Her name is Iris, by the way. She goes around and she starts asking her neighbors, do you have any salt? My husband bought home guests and I don't have any salt for the meat. By this word got around town that this visitor is staying in Lot's home and they're still eating. And all of a sudden, a group of, bandan, of bandits, of, you know, the, there's a protest. There was a protest outside uh, the, the, the home of Stone. I'm going to try and refrain from saying anything political about the protest, but there was a peaceful protest outside the home of Sodom and they started to break down the doors. Remember this thing about the doors. It's going to be important for you to know soon. They tried to break down the doors. And um, so Lot goes outside to them, and he says, please, my friend, my, my friends, my neighbors, these people that came, they're my, hope, they're my guests. I have a responsibility to protect them. Please don't do anything to them. Instead, you can take my daughters, which is also a crazy thing to say. Why a person would say, I'm willing to give you my daughters. The sages say that Lot is a fool for saying that. Anyway, they're not convinced, the people of Stone. This is principle. We don't want fun. We're not looking for your daughters. We don't want visitors. We want to give justice to those that are staying in our city. So anyway, at that moment, the crowd gets wild. And these two visitors that are staying in Lot's home that until then looked like regular men, they turn into angels. And they grab Lot from the, the mob that's starting to get violent. They bring him back inside, and they seal the door. And the people are trying to break down the door, and they can't find the door. Why? Because the angels make the men blind. The Torah says they struck everyone outside with blind. Every detail I'm telling you now is important. They say they struck everyone outside with blindness. And then they say to them that, come, we need to go quickly. We have to go before sundown, before sun sunbreak. Before the sun comes up, we need to leave the city because we're going to destroy the city. And all night it says that the angels are arguing with Lot and arguing back and forth until, and the nephew, the son-in-laws of Lot don't want to leave until finally it's almost going to be sunrise. And it's almost going to be sunrise. And um, they, the, the, two, the two angels grab Lot and they say, whoever is here, take him. Hold saving our market out of the place because mashchisim anachnu. The Hebrew words are important. Mashchisim anachnu. We are going to destroy this place because the cry is from a very strong Tashem. They grabbed them and they said, "You cannot look back." Al tismameh. They said, "Don't look back." And then the verse says, "Vayismama." But lo tari. And in the Hebrew, when you read this in the Torah on Shabbos, when you read this in the Torah. That word by Yisma is written with a shalshalas. It's four times in the entire Torah, where you have the musical note as follows. Which means, he tired, but when you have that long, long note, you can feel the hesitation. You can feel the panic. You can feel the uncertainty in Lot. He, he's being pushed to leave. 
but he doesn't want to leave. He doesn't want to leave. Until they grab him and they chase him out, they take him out. And as they're leaving, he said, they tell the angels, they don't look back. And uh, of course, what happens? Lot's wife does look back and she turns into a pillar of salt. And instead, Lot says, let me go to the city of Mitzar. And over there, he hides in the cave, etc. Let's understand what's going on in this story. Let's understand the secret dimension over here. Lot has to be saved. Why does Lot have to be saved? The city is so wicked, and Lot is, becomes part of the wickedness. Why does Lot have to be saved? Because the tikkun has to come from within the evil. The concept of Mashiach is a concept of Malchus, is a concept of Ishabcha, which means transformation. The only way to refine the evil of the world is from within the evil of the world. The example for this given in Kabbalah is that the only way to chop down a forest is with the handle of the axe that comes from the tree of the forest. Without a wooden handle on the axe, the metal blade would not be able to cut down a tree. It can cut it down because of the wood of the handle. So from the tree comes the handle of the axe that cuts down the tree. And so it is in every aspect of the tikkun, of rectifying and changing and transforming the universe. Where there is, the more evil that has to be transformed is the more the holiness that's there. And the job of Lot was to transform the holiness of, Lot, of, of stone, the evil, to find its holiness. Lot didn't do it. So now there's another sin that has to be rectified. But for Mashiach to come, for Mashiach to come, it has to come from within the city of stone, from within the destruction. And so I want to tell you now, so I can tell you how Mashiach comes from within that destruction. I'll tell you that soon. But first, I want to tell you something very, very amazing. That this story of the fact that Lot was saved from Sodom was on Pesach because the beginning of the Pesach story when the Jews leave Egypt, it really begins with the story of Lot being saved. Look at all the comparisons. Look at all the, 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 the comparisons between the Jews leaving Egypt and the angels taking Lot out of the stone. In both cases, first of all, the day is the exact same. It was the day, 14th day, the 15th day of Nisan. Both places, Mitzrayim and, uh, are called Kigan Hashem, and Stom are called like a garden of God. In both of them, the exodus happens over matz and over a meal. In both of them, the good guy, the Jews, are separated from the enemy that wants to kill them by a door. Slot has a door between him and the people who want to kill him. And the Jews on the night of Passover put the blood on the doorposts and they can't leave their doors. The Torah says they're not allowed to leave their doors. They were quarantined all night till the morning. The first quarantine of Jewish history on the first night of Pesach, we were not allowed to leave our homes. We were inside our doors. And just like the Lot's neighbors are struck with darkness, so too the people in Egypt were small with darkness. And just like Hashem says, the Hebrew word that he reigned, Sulfur on the land of stone, Hashem rained hail, the same Hebrew word, himtir, on the land of Egypt. And just like it says, the shaches Hashem, that Hashem, the angel said to God, to Lot, that God is going to destroy the city. Use the word shaches Hashem. And so to the words that are used about the angel of death, who's coming to be a negev, a plague, lim mashchis, to destroy. And the Jews are still in Egypt are there all night till the sun comes up in the morning. So too, Lot has to hide in his home till the morning before the sun comes up. And then Lot is being rushed and urged to leave by the angels in the middle of the night. And so too, the people living in Egypt are being rushed and urged to leave in the middle of the night by Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. And Lot hesitates by Yismama. And the people of Israel are starting to hesitate. And the Egyptians don't let them hesitate. They don't even have a chance for their dough to rise. It says in La Yachul Hismamea, the same Hebrew word. Lot was a Yismama. And we say in Agada with the dough didn't have a chance to rise because La Yachul Hismamea. And finally, Lot is instructed not to look back at the city of stone. And the Jews in the Egypt are instructed 
not to ever go back to Egypt. So the night of Pesach is a night of redemption. The first redemption is not the redemption of the Jews from Egypt. The first redemption is of Lot and his daughters from the city of stone. And by the way, a redemption has to be in a way of not looking back. Because when you look back, you're not really free. Redemption means, redemption means that you're no longer there. You're no longer there. I, I'll give you a beautiful example. On Friday night, when we say Lechadodi, the end of Lechadodi, we turn around, we face the, the West. So we're turning around to greet the Shabbos Queen. But it's also the idea that we're turning around, we're leaving the week behind. We're leaving the week behind, we're leaving the anxiety and the stress and the worries and the aggravation and whatever we dealt with all week. We turn around to greet the Shabbos. Turning around means that the week is behind us. It's behind us. Lot had to leave stone behind him. He, it was hard for him, but he did it. He towered, but he did it. Lot's wife couldn't leave stone behind her. She became part of stone. She became salt. The Jews leaving Egypt could only truly be redeemed from Egypt if they left Egypt behind. They had to leave without looking back. And therefore, the beginning of our redemption is that night. What happens? Lot and his daughters run to a cave. They run to a cave. And there, the daughters of Lot think that the entire world has been destroyed. They think that there's no humanity left besides for them. And so Lot's older daughter says to her sister, let's get our father drunk and let's be intimate with him. Let's have uh, intimacy with him so we can have children. The older two daughters had stayed behind with their husband. They didn't survive. Only two daughters survived. And they're single. So they get Lot drunk and the older daughter in the middle of the night while he's drunk, comes upon him, she becomes pregnant from him, and she has a child who she calls Moab. Moab, nation of the Moabites, means Me'av, from Me'av, from my father. Not a very modest name. The next night, again, Lot has gotten drunk by his daughter, and this time the younger daughter comes on her father, and she too becomes pregnant, and she is called, she calls her child Amon, which means from Ami, from my nation. Uh, the first virgin, now you're right here. Two girls alone in the cave with their old father, both becoming pregnant. I ask you, why is the Torah telling us this? Why do we need to know that Lot had two daughters that became pregnant through him and the nation of Ammon and Moab come from their father? This is the redemption of Mashiach right here, my friend. The story of the tikkun, the story of the redemption, of the fixing of the world is happening here. And we know that Moab is the ancestor of Ruth. Ruth the Moabite, who is a great-great-grandmother of King David, who is a great-great-great-grandfather of Mashiach. And Nama comes from Ammon. And Amma is an Ammonite princess that marries King Solomon, the son of David HaMelech. And she is the mother of Rehavam. She marries Shlomo. And Shlomo and Am Nama together have Rehavam, who is the continuation of the Davidic dynasty after Shlomo Melech passes away. So from Ammon and from Moab, from these two girls, the two daughters of Lot, is born the ancestors of Mashiach, which seemingly is crazy, such a backwards lineage. But that's the point. The tikkun of Avram did an amazing tikkun, and, and to go through the story about what Avram did, and then Yishmael and Eliezer, there's so much to the story, so much more story in the story. But just one detail of it, we're discussing that is stone. Stone was an opportunity of tikkun that didn't happen. But even though that tikkun didn't happen, it got put into Ammon, it got put into Moab, and all of the energy that spiritual holiness that existed in the land of stone was saved on that Passover. <coughs> in the intro to our Exodus later on. And this is how we study Torah. Why was the city of stone saved? What was the relevance for us if Lot went back? There's a war between Avraham and Nimrod happening. There's a conquering, a conquer, a, a, a transformation, a ultimate transforming of the land of Canaan and the land of Israel, where Avram has conquered the whole land from the south to the north. But Avram can't do it alone. And so Lot continues his opportunity, but he's too far into stone. And so we read about the destruction of stone, and we see, A, the similarities between that and 
and Passover. The exodus where God is saving the city of stone in the daughters of Naaman and the daughters of Lot. And by the way, you see how Lot messes up just like Noah does. Notice the similarities. Noah comes out of the ark and they think they're the only people alive in the universe. They are. And he becomes drunk. And because of his drunkenness, some very immoral behavior happens from which comes Canaan and all that. And so to Lot and his daughters, they're the only ones who survive the destruction, not of the flood, but of the upturning of the city of Sodom. And also they get drunk, Lot gets drunk, and also immorality happens, etc. Everything is the same story happening over and over. The same mess ups, the same tikkun, the same fiction. But without Ram, we began to fix the tree. And with Lot, didn't do his job, but we are doing that. And this is just one facet. I found it fascinating. I'll only give a little bit of it, of a spiritual insight to the land of stone. And again, I want to say one more time, go to mychabadcenter.org forward slash JLI, and you can become part of the next six week. Six week, I'm going to post it right here on the comment on, on, on Facebook. Um, you could become part of the six week course. If money is an issue, please, please, please just email me and I will give you a scholarship to allow you to become part of the, uh, the course. It's going to be an absolutely amazing course, discovering the inner dimensions, the inner secrets, the inner truth of what is the Torah. Good night, my friends. God bless you all. Laila Tov. Be well.